How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. Because all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls away. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. At the conclusion of the book of Galatians, in Galatians chapter 6, verse number 16, the Apostle Paul writes, And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them, and mercy, and upon the Israel of God. Very, very interesting terminology that Paul uses there. Actually, he's referring to the Lord's church whenever he makes that statement, the Israel of God. Welcome to the Biblical Christianity Podcast. My name is Terrence Brownlow Dindy, Director of the Texas School of Preaching, one of the elders of the BCS Church of Christ. The Biblical Christianity Podcast is the official podcast of the BCS Church of Christ and the Texas School of Preaching. Today I've got in the studio with me a couple of esteemed colleagues. First of all, Brother Brant Stubblefield. Uh, Brant was on, with us on last week and, and so very glad to have Brother Brant with us again here today. Then we also have Brother Tom Waycaster. Brother Tom Waycaster has been an instructor in many schools of preaching, the Memphis School of Preaching most recently, and is also an adjunct instructor at the Tech School of Preaching, a scholar of the Bible, who has written many commentaries, and we appreciate the fine work, Brother Waycaster, that you've done over the years and the great contribution that you've made to the Brotherhood. So, so glad to have you with us in the studio. A special treat for us today, Brother. So, Nowadays, obviously, if you keep your finger on the pulse of politics, then you know that Israel is in the news on a daily basis. Of course, there is some conflict going on over in the Palestinian area between Hamas and Israel, the state of Israel. And of course, we, we hear about this all the time. Obviously, a lot of people have different, different opinions on what is going on over there, who's in the right, who's in the wrong, and certainly who should be supported and who shouldn't. And of course, uh, you know that a lot of our universities here in the United States of America has chosen to fall on the side of Hamas here lately. And it's really kind of strange to be just to be absolutely uh, candid about it. But of course, uh, universities such as Berkeley, California, and Columbia have been in the news most often here lately as, as those who are having anti-Israel or anti-Semitic rallies and of course, uh, this is very interesting times for us. Of course, we know that whenever we look at the world of, of Protestant denominationalism, uh, there is a very popular denominational doctrine called dispensational premillennialism. And of course, when we talk about premillennialism, uh, they've got a different view of Israel and, and what God's relationship is to Israel even to this day. And, of course, we believe that some of their viewpoints are misguided and, and a result of some misinterpretation of the Scripture. But they believe that ethnic Israel is still the, the same chosen people of God today that they always were. We certainly don't deny that ethnic Israel were the chosen people of God. The Bible is emphatic in regards to that particular truth. And so we're going to look at some of those things, but we also want to go where the Bible goes with this subject matter. And as Paul mentions, as we just quoted at the beginning of our podcast, the Israel of God, his reference is not to ethnic Israel, but is to the church of Christ. And of course, not only in Galatians, but in the book of Romans, he makes this very, very clear to us. And so we want to look at some of those scriptures just to make sure that we help people to understand from a religious perspective that Israel, the Israel of the New Testament, the new Israel, the Israel of God, if you will, is a reference to the Lord's church. And we'll talk about how all of that works very briefly in just a moment. But then we also want to look at some modern day considerations. So we want to look at ethnic Israel first. We want to look at the Israel of God in the second place and then look at some modern day considerations. And where should we stand in regards to the political uh, drama just being played out in Palestine today? So first and foremost, Brother Brandt, uh, what about the Israel uh, of ethnicity, the, the Israel that derives from Abraham, Genesis chapter 12? Yeah. Absolutely. You know, it's true, as you mentioned, the Old Testament makes it fundamentally clear to any Bible student that there's a series of promises and that Christ is going to come through a particular nation, right? A particular, as you say, ethnic. And, and that's going to be the nation of Israel. Mm -hmm. 
But some people are confused. They think that the nation of Israel is always going to be uh, the people of God in that in the sense of their ethnicity right. and, and in their birthright, so to speak, when in reality was the nation of Israel was the avenue by which the Redeemer is going to come, and he is going to offer salvation to Jew and to Gentile. Yeah, I don't think that that can be overlooked. It is overlooked by people, Brother Way Caster, in the religious world, particularly in, in Protestant denominationalism. But it cannot be overlooked and us have a proper understanding of the Bible, can it? Well, that's correct. I think the world has been influenced by and large with the premillennialist concept. Mm -hmm. And the premillennialist concept is looking for a physical kingdom. They are, in fact, guilty of exactly the same mistake that ancient Israel made. Mm -hmm. When Jesus was prophesied, uh, ancient Israel could not separate the prophecies of the Messiah and the prophecies of a suffering servant. Mm -hmm. And so they were looking for some kind of an explanation, and it would be this physical kingdom that the Messiah would come and set up. Mm -hmm. Well, the failure to recognize there's a difference between physical Israel and spiritual Israel then it's carried over into the New Testament and has become the fundamental foundation of the doctrine of premillennialism. That's exactly right, brother. You look at many of the Old Testament prophecies, of course, as Brother Brant mentioned, it was prophesied that Israel would be the nation that would bring yes. forth the Christ, and that would be fundamentally the, the uh, importance of that nation. We go back to the promise that God made to Abraham in the book of Genesis, chapter 12, verse number one and following. And of course, God had called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees and then obviously reiterated that call whenever he was in Haran with his family, which is uh, kind of to the north, north of the, the Mesopotamian area. But he says, God does, now the Lord, or the Bible says, that now the Lord has said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, curse them that curses thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And so that is a promise that is reiterated to Abraham multiple times. And then to the next generation, to his son Isaac, mm -hmm. and also to Jacob. And of course, we know that it comes to full fruition during the generation of Jacob, whenever he uh, begets 12 sons which would make up or formulate the nation of Israel. And of course, that it does in fact become the nation of God for the duration of the Old Testament economy. But again, even the Old Testament itself will point to a day in which all men would be able to be defined as God's children. I'm mindful, Brother Boy Castro, of places like the book of Hosea, chapter 1, verse yeah. 10 and 11, and the prophecy, there's some very strange names that are assigned by God to Hosea's children. He says, name one of your children, Jezreel, of course, one Lo Ruhama, and one Lo Ami. And of course, those last two names respectively meaning no mercy and not my people. And of course, we don't really come to understand the full significance of those names until we go, come to a place like Romans chapter 9 or 1 Peter chapter 2, where that passage of Scripture is quoted by both of these New Testament inspired authors, Peter and Paul, to say that what God was demonstrating is that there would come a day in which people who had no mercy or were not the recipients, if you will, of God's mercy as far as a covenant nation is concerned, would be able to enter into God's covenant of mercy, and those who were not God's people will be able to be called his people. Yeah, and one thing that we need to emphasize is that repeatedly in the New Testament, there is a strong emphasis that that physical nation would in fact come to cease as a, as a religious part of God's plan. So far as Israel today on the other side of the globe, if you look at the nation of Israel strictly from a political standpoint, it is a nation that stands for freedom. It is a nation that is seeking to free have free people even in the midst of countries that surround them right. that oppose that kind of freedom. So there's still a physical aspect but that's not the emphasis in the Bible, not the physical. It is always the spiritual. Yeah, that emphasis goes away once you get to the New yeah. Testament, right? Yeah, I was thinking about this passage in Galatians chapter 4 where the Apostle Paul gives an allegory. And he talks about uh, one uh, being representative of the nation of Israel and the other of the Ishmaelites. And I find it incredibly interesting that when you get down to verse 25, here's what Paul writes. He said, Now this Hagar... 
is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answers to the Jerusalem that now is, for she is in bondage unto her children. But the Jerusalem that is above, there's your spiritual Israel, the Jerusalem that is above is free, which is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry, thou that travailest not, for more are the children of the desolate than of her that hath the husband. Now listen to how he closes this. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh, here's your Jewish, your physical Israel, he that was born after the flesh persecutes him that was born after the Spirit. So also it is now. How be it, what saith the Scripture? Cast out the handmaid and her son, for the son of the handmaid shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. Sure. I don't know how language can be any clearer to emphasize that that physical nation went by the wayside so far as religious purpose and that the church rose up as the free woman, the yes, one sir. who provides the spiritual blessings. Yes, sir. And, and it's just so crystal clear. You you need some help to miss it. I used to hear the old school preacher say, man, you need some help to misunderstand In, in yes, fact, in Romans 2, 28 and 29, I believe that's the passage. The New Testament Christian today is described in that passage mm -hmm. as the Jew, mm -hmm. not outwardly of yes, circumcision, yes, but sir. inwardly. That's exactly right. That's the point that Paul's making. Of course, when you look at the Roman letter, and it speaks broadly and very clearly to the subject matter because Paul is is dealing with the church 24 years into his existence when the book of Romans is written and there's still this this prevailing problem of this this idea of Jewish supremacy and the ability or the assertion that we can circumvent God's system which culminates in the Christ and still be able to capitalize on the justification that God provides, being able to pronounce those righteous who comply with his will. But again, he's dealing with that Jewish mindset that says that we can circumvent the Christ and rely upon our Jewishness. In fact, you know, even some of those Christians that had, excuse me, even those Jewish people, some of which had become Christians. Yeah. The early church had to, one of their main culprits of, of, of false teachers was linked to mm -hmm. Judaizing teachers. You know, That's Acts 15.1, right. mm -hmm. they accept you be circumcised after the manner of Moses. You cannot be saved. Mm -hmm. And elders were warned in Titus chapter 1 that, uh, you know, there would be the mouths of circumcision that would have to be stopped. So that was prevailing. That's exactly right. And what Brother Tom just read just a moment ago is that book that deals with that same idea of these Judaizing teachers trying to continue to uphold and exalt a system and a people, the ethnic Jews, that no longer have any significance, not that God has belittled them. I mean, you go to Romans chapter 11, and he makes a point, man, I love the Jewish people. And, and, and Paul says, man, I want them saved. And God has not totally cast them off. If they become believing as opposed to unbelieving that God will graft them back in to use that illustration to the natural tree from which they were, were, were grown. Now this passage in Romans chapter 11, I was just looking at this statement that Paul makes in the latter part of this chapter when he talks about how is Israel, physical Israel, going to be saved. Some read this passage in verse 26, Romans mm -hmm. chapter 11 and verse 26, and they conclude that what Paul is saying is all physical Israel right. will be saved. Mm -hmm. But Paul doesn't say that. He said, so shall all Israel be saved. But he's saying in the same manner. Yeah, Israel is going to be saved. Jewish uh, ethnicity, the Jewish race, those who are of the blood of the of the seed of Abraham today, they can be saved, mm -hmm. but they shall be saved in the same manner that the Gentiles are saved. That's exactly right. So all Israel should be saved is going to be, if we read the scriptures, we got to allow the scripture to interpret the scripture for us or to be its own best commentary. Which, which makes perfect sense when we come to Galatians chapter 3, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Who is an heir of, of, the, of the seed of the promise? Or who may be saved? Well, you're going to be saved, like Brother Waycaster mentioned, the same way. Mm -hmm. So there's neither male nor female. There's neither. There's no distinctive groups or ethnic, ethnicities that's going to prevail 
at the end of the day, mm-hmm. if you're going to be saved, you're going to be saved because you've been baptized into Christ Jesus. That's exactly right. In Ephesians chapter 2, this is also expounded upon by the Apostle Paul in this beautiful treatise about the church. There's no no doubt about it. Whenever you come to the book of Ephesians, it's, it's simple. It's about the church. I'm studying with a good buddy of mine in, in Anaheim, California. We study via Skype each week, and and I'd asked him after we'd gone through several fundamental things about salvation, asked him, well, man, do you got anything that you've been studying that you would like for saying, oh, man, I'd like to go over the book of Ephesians. I've been reading through that, man. That's about the church, isn't it? He asked me. I'm like, you got it, brother. You, you got it, man. He's, he's not a brother in Christ yet, but just, you yes. know, we were martial arts buddies together. So so it's in that context that I refer to him as that. But uh, yes, it's about the church. Paul says it's a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church in that beautiful passage in Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 32. And speaking of the church, look what he says in beginning in verse Verse number 12 of or verse number 11 about the about the Gentile. Wherefore, remember that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were afar off were made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, listen to this, who has made both one, talking about the Jew and the Gentile, and has broken down the middle wall or partition between us, that's the law of Moses, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make it himself of two, one new man, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile both, that is again, Jew and Gentile, unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. And so as both of these brothers have pointed out, the plan was always to go from ethnic Israel the people of God to comprehensive or new Israel or the Israel of God to use the express terminology of Paul, which is inclusive of both Jew and Gentile. And so when we look over at the, the nation of Israel today and the conflict that they're in, you know, brother, Waycaster, I would definitely say this as we talk about some, some current issues that any type of anti-Semitic sentiment is something that is unfounded. Uh, we shouldn't be against anyone because of their ethnicity. Exactly. We understand that. We that that's fundamental. And I don't understand how how people who seem to be those who clamor for civil and social rights in this country are the same ones that are are leading these this anti-Israel charges. Man, I mean, are, is prejudice good or is it not? Is bigotry right or is it not? Man, we can't have it both both ways. No, you can't. <laughs> and James makes it clear that we're not to look upon anyone based right. upon a different status in life. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've found it very interesting in the work that I've done in India in the past that when a person is converted to Christ, he abandons what is sometimes called the caste system in India. Okay. And in fact, he will even register the next time that the uh, registry is made for, for the census, they will put on their form no caste. They recognize that this physical distinctions that we see in color of skin or nationalities, that all goes by the wayside. Become a Christian, yes, you know, sir. brother Terrence. Sometimes when you're talking to people, I am torn, right? Because this discussion is really an in-depth discussion. Mm-hmm. So you meet someone they don't know uh, that I'm a Christian. Let's say we're just at the coffee shop or we're talking to say, "Hey, do you support Israel?" Mm-hmm. Well, yes, in the sense of I believe that they're a nation that uh, has democracy. Mm-hmm. They promote mm-hmm. freedom. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so far as what they do that is right, then yes, but. The discussion we're having today, the mm-hmm. province, the reason it's confusing is because a lot of people believe that the physical boundaries of Israel mm-hmm. that, quote, God had promised them, yeah. they believe that that is extended until today. Mm-hmm. So many, quote, evangelicals, if I may use that word, mm-hmm. they think that at the ballot box and through the American dollar mm-hmm. that we have to uphold Israel yes. because if we don't, they would think that maybe it would be the case that we would be in trouble religiously since they believe that Christ is coming back to earth. Yes, yeah, so that's a very good point. That's really kind of the crux of what we are talking about. Again, they, they believe that this physical plot of land is is still holy. You know, a thing is holy is God if God has consecrated it as such, and he did at one point in time, 
But again, as we've mentioned, that all of that goes away. Jesus Christ made it very plain and very clear in speaking to the Samaritan woman at the well of Jacob that geographical significance goes away yeah. in Christianity. He made it clear because remember the question she asked whenever he makes her uncomfortable yes. about trying to talk about her relationship, you know, go get your husband. And then she says, uh, I don't have a husband. He says, that's right. You've had five and the guy you shacked up with right now is not your husband. And so she was uncomfortable about that. She changes the subject quick, fast, and in a hurry. Mm -hmm. She says, look, you know, your fathers say that Jerusalem is the place we ought to worship. Our fathers believe we worship here. Obviously a reference to Mount Gerizim, if you understand the history of the Samaritans. And Jesus Christ will help her to understand that in, in the coming kingdom of Christ, in the Christian dispensation, geographical location is not going to be of any importance in worshiping God, but those who are willing to worship him in spirit and in truth will rise to the top of the prior, priority list of importance. Yeah, this, this uh, doctrine of premillennialism is based upon a faulty perception that for some reason Israel never got their borders. They never got their kingdom, and so that mm -hmm. still needs to be settled. Mm -hmm. And yet the Bible clearly teaches that all the promises that God made yeah. were fulfilled. And if you think about this, what is a, a nation? A nation is made up of people, a law, and a land. Sir. The people were the physical Jews in Old Testament Israel, the law was the Old Testament law of Moses, and the land were those boundaries that were set by God and conquered by Joshua and then later expanded by Solomon. Mm -hmm. But all came to pass. That means there is no more promise of a land settlement yes. for Israel. May I read that, Brother Waycaster? Yes. Uh -huh. I think he's referenced in Joshua chapter 21, verse 43. Mm -hmm. The Bible says, And the Lord gave unto Israel all the land which he sware to give unto their fathers, and they possessed it and dwelt therein. And the Lord gave them rest round about according to all that he sware unto their fathers, and there stood not a man of all their enemies before them. The Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. There failed not aught of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel. All came to pass. And one more, chapter 23, verse 14. And behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth. And ye know in all your hearts and all your souls that not one thing hath failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you. All are come to pass unto you, and not one thing hath failed thereof. That's it. So you know, we look at this thing basically in three dimensions. So number one, the dimension that you guys just mentioned, that God has fulfilled the promise. Yes. I mean, by the end of the conquest of Joshua, the promise was fulfilled. They possessed it. They possessed they it. They dwelt there. That's mm -hmm. right. Everything that God said he was going to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they possessed. Tom mentioned later under Solomon. They even expanded it. Yep. That's exactly right. Now the second dimension is when you go to places like Leviticus chapter 20 and also places like Deuteronomy 27 to 30, man, sometimes these premillennials forget that this was also conditional promises. God's promises have always been conditional. And so he lets them know that if you follow my commandments, this land will always be yours. If you disobey my commandments, I will spew you out as our land will spew you out. It's like the Canaanites before you had been spewed out. You guys are going into captivity. And of course, with about 700 years of incessant idolatry from the time they build these golden calves, yep. you know, and, and at the base of Mount Sinai, all the way up to the prophecies of Hosea and Amos to the Northern Empire, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Micah to the Southern Empire. You know, you're looking at, at comprehensively about 700 years of incessant idolatry. God had to do what he said he was going to do. And he ends up spewing them out of the land, the Assyrians in 722 B.C., would take captive Samaria. And then, of course, we know about 150 years later that the southern empire of Judah would be taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the Chaldeans in yep. Babylon. And so, so there's also that dimension of the conditional aspect of the promise. But then, again, that third dimension, which we've already mentioned, is that at the end of the day, all that significance goes away once the promises have been fulfilled ultimately. And ultimately, that nation that you mentioned, Brother Tom, just a moment ago, the, the nation, or the, the people, the, the land and the law, all that is brought together, brought to fruition by God for an express purpose, yeah. and that is to bring the Christ into the, to this world. Brother Johnny Ramsey used to say this in talking about the miraculous age of the first century and the infant church. 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and he would deal with the idea that the Bible says that when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part will be done away with. Of course, that which is in part is a reference to that miraculous knowledge, the ability to speak in tongues, and all of these miracles, supernatural gifts of the Spirit that were for the infant church. Johnny would always say that, you know, think of it in terms of scaffolding. As a skyscraper is going up, I used to live in Houston, Texas, and so you see this all the time. The buildings in downtown going up, the scaffolding is yellow or orange, generally speaking, and scaffold scaffolding goes up with the building. The building goes up with scaffolding, maybe I should say. But when the building's through. But when the building is through, they don't leave the scaffolding there. They remove it so that all the functionality and the beauty of the architecture could be seen and utilized. Well, same thing when it comes to the Jewish nation, right, brother? Wake yeah. You think about the purpose and the promises uh, God needed to provide a means by which the Messiah could come. Mm -hmm. Now, this traces all the way back to Genesis 3. Yes, sir. That of the seed of the woman. But as you trace that down through a specific people, which is the seed of Abraham, mm -hmm. there was a purpose in that, and it was to get things ready for the Messiah to come. Mm -hmm. And then in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, when the fullness of time was come, sure. he sent forth his son. So the purpose for physical Israel was to provide that safety in which the seed could eventually be brought forth without being contaminated by idolatry. Mm -hmm. And once that purpose was achieved, then the spiritual took the emphasis, and you have all the way back to the beginning here, Isaiah, uh, Galatians chapter 6, spiritual Israel. That's it, brother. And that might be what you just spoke to, a part of the problem. When I was a freshman in college at the University of Oklahoma, staying in Walker Tower, floor number 6, I, I remember the you know, first weekend of school, we're all on our floor getting to know each other, and everybody's out there socializing. I remember I had a, a floor mate by the name of Kiefer. It was his name. I don't remember his last name. But he and I were in his in his dorm room talking one day, and you know he told me that he was Jewish, and that that piqued my interest a little bit. You know, I was a young fledgling Christian at the time, but but you know I knew that the Jews that rejected Christ, and I'd ask him, you know, what are your thoughts on Jesus of Nazareth? I mean, the Bible says that he is the Christ, the Messiah. The Jewish nation was looking for the, the, the Messiah. The Jewish nation was created for, mm -hmm. and I understand that Jews today don't believe that he's a Messiah still. And he's like, yeah, he confirmed mm -hmm. that. He's like, that's right. We don't believe. So maybe they believe that the significance of ethnic Israel continues to to exist because they don't believe that the Messiah has come yet. Yeah. But again, you have to reject an awful lot of scripture. To you know, when Alexander Campbell in a debate that he had with regard to Judaism and the place of the church, he asked a question to a Jew, this very interesting question. He said, today, how does a Jew achieve atonement? Mm. Seeing that you can't trace your genealogy back to the seed of Abraham. And the Jew admitted, this Jew to whom Alexander Campbell was uh, commenting, he admitted, I guess we have to do it through prayer. Mm -hmm. Mr. Campbell mm -hmm. made this observation. He said, there is nowhere in all of your law where atonement is achieved through prayer. That's right. And when you think about that question he presented to this Jew, it shows you the eventual cessation of the Jewish law. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, Tyler, good point, because in AD 70, when the temple, right, yeah. all of those things are brought down. Of course, we know yeah. the law was taken out of the cross. Mm -hmm. But then it wasn't very long until the temple was brought down in AD 70. Yeah. That's it. it it's yeah. the finality and the closure of that. So how would a Jew today achieve atonement? Yeah, How would you achieve atonement? How would you carry out any aspect of exactly. Judaism for exactly. that matter? The records are gone. The genealogy is gone. The temple is gone. Man, how integral is the temple to the Jewish economy and the Jewish yeah. religious system? Very yeah. good point. But it's gone. And so, so with all that being said, you know, we say this, we... We don't endorse any type of anti-Semitic sentiment, the stuff that's going on at, at some of our liberal universities in, in this country is shameful, shouldn't be allowed to go on, it should right. not be happening, it's absolutely shameful, it's contradictory to what they claim, the people who are responsible for these things, what they claim they stand for, claim you stand for freedom, you claim you stand for liberty, you claim that you stand for equal rights for all of humanity, but then... Uh, we're sitting around and got a whole movement going uh, and, and, and or being motivated by 
don't know, the prejudice against a particular nation. And so that's that's problematic. But at the same time, but at the same time, we'll also have to make it clear that our evangelical neighbors have missed a mark and don't mean to be facetious or insulting at all, but just facts of the matter that we've already shown you. The promises have been fulfilled. They've been fulfilled. God doesn't owe yeah. ethnic Israel a thing. And the purpose for which they were constructed has been fulfilled. The Messiah has come. All right. And whenever the Bible begins to talk about the salvation of Israel, of all Israel, Romans chapter 11, 26, as Brother Waycaster mentioned a moment ago, you have to understand that that is a, a verse that's got to be interpreted in light of Galatians 6, 16 and Romans chapter 2, verse 28 and 29 or 27, 28. All right, so we're talking about a new Israel. Romans, or excuse me, Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 and 2 also speaks to that subject matter. And so uh, we, we, we pray for the salvation of ethnic Israel today, and we pray for the salvation of all men. That's God's desire, First Timothy chapter 2, verse number 4. But we have to accept the Bible for what it says. Appreciate you guys being with us today. Certainly very thankful for... Uh, my colleagues who are in the studio, and I think it was a fine conversation. Appreciate the Bible knowledge that is uh, emanated from these two men and appreciate their studies and scholarship. And we always, on the Biblical Christianity Podcast, simply want to tell you and expound upon what the Word of God has got to say about any subject matter that we deal with. As always, our email address is at the bottom of the screen. If you'd like to, you could email us and and. Give us any questions that you may have, any suggestions for future episodes, and we'll be glad to entertain those. Thank you, and we'll join you. We'll be with you again next time.